No one's saying hi to them. Let me say hi. What's going on, guys? How you guys doing this morning? That was corny. That was lame. We're playing golf today. No, we're not. We just scored a touchdown on the Super Bowl line. Amen. Yeah, this is what they would consider like Passion Week. Jesus is walking down this last intensified week leading up to our deliverance, although it cost him everything. Um, I'm going to pray. We're going to get into today's message as we wrap up um, the series that we are in. Hopefully you've been getting something out of it. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, I spent the last two weeks talking about gossip. <laughs> I was after him. All of us. I mean, it was after all of us. And I have to be honest, the way that my brain works, I, and this is maybe my wiring in general, no one knows what's going on in my mind, but I do. And sometimes when I try to act like it's, there's nothing in there, I kind of feel funny about it. And so I talk too much, but I did. I woke up with a mood. <laughs> and I, I'm like, can I call out today? Ten, I'm talking about, bro, I was like, I don't even feel like coming. I'm going to stress Paul out in the team and everything else. And when I came up here for ministry time, I prayed for you guys like I typically do. I always pray for the services that uh, people that are there. But then I, I prayed for myself. I said, Lord, I'm going to have to walk by faith, and I need you to meet me as I'm walking like Abraham. Let's go. So I'm going to pray. And I can I tell you right now, there's somebody who's watching me who's a leader. Like, he shouldn't be saying all that. I'm just being me. You be you, sir, and I'm going to be me. <laughs> And I'm going to get it out of the way. Then I feel better about it, even though you didn't know. <laughs> I knew. And then we'll pray about it and trust God walking by faith. In Jesus' name, amen. So, Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you, Lord, uh, because my, my emotions are engaged. They're not a guide. They don't dictate my life. You do. So I thank you, Lord, for the power to make decisions. I thank you, Lord, because I can align my will with your will. Cho uh, decisions uh, lead, feelings follow. Choices lead. Feel so we make a decision, Lord, to show up today. We make a decision to worship you. We make a decision to serve you. We make a decision, Lord, to allow your spirit to govern our lives. But I know that you need our participation. So we thank you for your sovereignty. But we, 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 we also say, uh, he here's our responsibility. So, Father, take the rest of the service. Holy Spirit, we trust you. We need you. We depend on you. I know I do. In Jesus' name, somebody say amen. 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 Okay, so we're going to get into, oh, let me mention something about, um, hold on, dude, my mind is all over. How much time I got? Um, yeah. Hold on, one more thing, one more thing. I was thinking about this during worship. Cassie was doing an MC moment, and while she was talking, I was just thinking, it's possible that when you're in those spaces, and you're having a mood, and you're in emotions, and maybe you got carryover from a previous day. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. Act like you don't know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Uh -huh. And so sometimes that can happen. And when that happens, sometimes when you show up in, in the presence of God like this with other believers, sometimes the Bible says in John chapter 4, when Jesus was talking to the woman at the well, he said uh, the time is coming and has now come that when God, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. He says we're going to worship in spirit and in truth. But he's looking for worshipers. That's my point. My point is, is that he's not necessarily looking for watchers. No. Maybe I'm preaching this to myself, and sometimes you've got to do that. Uh, the Bible says that when David came back after there was a war and the whole place got decimated, the Bible says there was so much trauma that no one was there to encourage him, and he had to encourage himself in the Lord. Maybe that's what I'm doing right now. This ain't got nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with me. But, but needless to say, let me finish my thought, that the Bible says that he's looking for worshipers, not watchers. And when you're in your emotions and you show up at church, you find yourself watching. And when you watch with a bad heart, you're criticizing everything you see. Uh huh. So the goal is to close your eyes, really, and get lost in worship instead of worry about what she's wearing and what he's wearing and who's up there and everything else. Somebody said, Lord, I'm here to worship you. That's right. Ice Cube said, check yourself before you wreck yourself. That was old. That's a old statement. So uh, one more. This is not an announcement, but just to celebrate the launch of uh, life groups. Um, we ended up launching 32 groups around two weeks ago, right? On the first week, there was around 425 people that signed up, which was pretty cool, which means uh, and then we had like 240, 50 people that were unique, which means some of you signed up multiple for multiple groups. That's, but that's not a problem. Uh, and so up to this, at least the first week, around 40 percent of people were in a life group for the first week. So that's amazing to me. Yeah. Uh, we're not at that 50% mark, but that's amazing. You know why? Because that means that people, at least in this location, throughout a standard week, were getting together with other believers outside of Sunday. Because how many people know that Jesus is doing life outside of Sunday? So this is, that, that's, that was a great stat. So, uh, another, let me mention one more thing. 
Um, Mike and Robin, they have a group called The Bait of Satan, and, and that book is a, a classic, and it has to do with dealing with offense. And so I just want to invite you that if you could be honest with yourself and you know you're dealing with some offense, you want to go through that material, or maybe sign up for their group. And then there's another uh, young lady named Alice and her sister. They're doing something on intimacy with God. It's a book by, I think, Beth Moore. Uh, but needless to say, um, if you want some of that in your life, sign up for that group. And that takes place on later on Sundays. Okay, so we've been in this series on uh, You Can Say That Again. And at least for this location, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, we're one church in many locations. And one of the unique aspects about having the same subject matter at different locations, we all have the uniqueness to be able to communicate it the way that God has uh, impressed it upon our hearts. Yeah. So if you listen to Pastor Wayne in New York City, he might have talked about some other things. Uh, I, I'm not sure. I haven't checked him out uh, during this series. Uh, for me, uh, I decided to go at it more from an angle where you can't say that again, <laughs> if you will. The last two weeks, I've been talking about the subject of gossip. And if I wanted, I just want to highlight one thing that I said. I defined last week that gossip was bearing bad news. Uh, 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 what, what was it? Bearing bad news. Oh my God, I forgot the little thing in between. My, out of a bad heart, behind someone's back, out of a bad heart. My, the antithesis of that would be to bear good news. And isn't it ironic that even though we discovered over the last two weeks that the word gossip in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 3, was the word devil. And it's ironic because the truth of God, God's word and God who is truth, he gave his word and his command in the Garden of Eden. So truth was there. And then the devil, gossip, shows up in the garden to, to alter the truth of God's word. So when Satan showed up, gossip showed up translated his truth into error, and as a result of Eve biting that, if you will, and, and, and all of humanity ended up falling as a result of that first gossip. It's interesting to note, and I alluded to this a couple weeks ago, how God understood that that bad news has been permeating for years. Yeah. Yeah. And God had to show up in the form of good news and present himself to the world. Mm -hmm. Hence why we have Easter coming up right now. Because Jesus died and resurrected so he, we can keep spreading good news that God is not mad at the world, that God, if God wanted to send a condemner, he would have sent the condemner, but God wanted to save the world, so he sent the world a savior. Uh huh. And so we're going to end up talking about that next week when I get into that Easter message and those good, that Good Friday weekend, et cetera, et cetera. But today I simply want to talk to you about being able to take God's word and share God's word with other people, which is good news, consequently inviting them either to come to church or to have a relationship with him because God is not going to do that independently of you. Yeah. That we have an assignment, y'all. Yeah. That where you are, you're there on purpose in the season of life that you are. So for those of you who are in college, you're in college in this season on purpose. God understands that. For some of you out of school, dropped out of school, wherever you are, God knows exactly where you are, and he wants to use your mouth where you are. The name of my message today is, can God use your words to share his word? Can God use your words to share his word? Can we invite people either to come to church on Easter, uh, to take another step, maybe at a, one of our life groups, to connect with God? Because God wants to reach the world, and he's not going to do it independently of you. The angels that are in heaven have not been given a great commission to share the gospel. You have. The gospel has been committed to people. And if your life has been impacted because of the gospel, you're here Incidentally, because somebody shared something with you. Yeah. You're here because somebody said something to you, either about him, about his word, either their own testimony about what God did in their life. And as a result, you started to inch your way a little bit closer to him. Albeit that be a small group, a life group, coming to church, whatever that might look like. You got closer to God because someone wasn't intimidated to invite you to get closer to him. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So if, if you take a stethoscope, you know what that is? Okay, some of you do, some of you don't. Uh, yeah, so if you ever go to the hospital and they put that thing in their ears and they put it on your heart, if you take a stethoscope and you put it on the heart of God, I'm convinced that it beats people. <laughs> Somebody say people. 
If you put that thing on God's heart, I guarantee you it beats <laughs> Susan, <laughs> Linda, <laughs> Johnny. It just beats people. And God is not impressed when people drift from him. He's not impressed or excited when he loses people. He's not excited when one, when if he has a hundred children and one of them drifts, God says, I can't take my mind off of the one that walked away. I will chase down the one. I, I, will, I will celebrate the 99 that are in the house, but I really don't need to focus on them if they are safe in the fold. Who I need to go after is the lost one. Uh-huh. 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 In Luke chapter 15, verses 8 to 10, here's an opening verse for you. It says, or oh, suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp? Sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it. And when she finds it, she calls her friends and her neighbors, and she gets them all together. Apparently, this coin was so important that she's about to just have a party. Like, she's gathering people together be because one matters in the kingdom. I said one matters in the kingdom. Yeah, anytime you lose something that has value, it matters to you. Anytime you, you lose something that has sentiment, it, it has value to you, and you, you are going to do everything to find it. Verse 9 says that she calls all of these people together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. And Jesus says, In the same way, I tell you that there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner, who repents. This woman lost something of value. She went and found that thing. When she found it, it made such an impression on her heart that it wasn't enough just to celebrate in isolation. It wasn't enough just to celebrate by herself. She actually invited all her friends over and all her family over to say, let me show you how important this thing was in my life because I found something that I have lost. And then Jesus gives this parallel. He says, in the same way, when one person, one person who's separated from God, one person who's drifted from God, one person who's a sinner who, who don't have relationship with God, bad English, good preaching, who doesn't have a relationship with God, when they change their mind for the better toward God, there is more rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God. I, I do want to stop and let's highlight. Can you put that verse back up there, verse 10? It says that there is more rejoicing in the presence of the angels. Let's just highlight that it didn't say that there's rejoicing in the presence of God. It almost gives us the impression that whoever's in front of the angels is the one who's dancing. I would have to suggest to you that Jesus is up there doing something. He is up there rejoicing, and there's an actual, there's a real cipher. There's a, there's a whole group of people, and they break dancing, and yeah, and they're, in, they're doing it in the presence of the angels. So, so is it possible that God is the one who's rejoicing? Is it possible that it's the witnesses, other believers in Christ who are rejoicing because they see people turning and coming back to God. I don't know if you've lost anything that, I mean, I don't know if you've had anything that you lost that was significant. Anybody ever lose a child? Had a few hands go up. They wasn't sure about that. They was like, do I want to admit that in church? I remember one time we had this little uh, uh, decent setup where the, the bus would come and drop the children off right near the house. How many people are like that? Well, you don't have to walk down the street to be out there shivering in this kind of weather that's out there. And it would come and you could just watch them through the window, like go out there by yourself, just go out there. And, and they would drop the kids off. You could drop them off and then take them to school. And I, and I remember my little girl, uh, Rhea, she got on the bus and Evan got on the bus and we put them both on the bus and they got on the bus and they went over to school. When the day was over with and they went to drop off the kids, the bus showed up, and Rhea got out, and the doors closed. Oh, my gosh, it's right. I started running after the bus. She closed the door and started driving. I said, oh, no, this is incomplete. Now this transaction is not done. I started chasing the bus down the street, going after barefooted. Lady just kept on driving. I said, oh, my God, what am I going to do? I jumped on the phone. I jumped in the car, came back, drove down to the school to go see if I can find my lost son. 
get down to the school, and Evan is nowhere to be found in the entire building. We went into every classroom looking for Evan. We're making phone calls, and we cannot find him. How many people know that at that time, I don't care how safe you are, your mind is creating all kinds of scenarios. I thought that Al-Qaeda kidnapped my son, and they was using him to groom him as a future terrorist. Once again, this is my head, not yours. So this is what's going on in my mind. Two hours go by, we can't find Evan. My heart is palpitating. I don't know what's going on. Every Bible verse is coming out of me. I'm just trying to, Lord, you said this. This is your promise. Where's my son? When eventually we get a call from the bus driver when she parks her bus uh, to go do a sweep through to see if anybody left belongings and anything. Evan was so short at that time. The seats were so high. She never noticed that he didn't get off the bus and he was sitting in there the entire time. And when she went to go do the sweep, she says, why didn't you get up? We have no explanation why we all went, had a panic attack, and we needed all kinds of this. Yeah, eventually they brought Evan home. I just want to suggest to you that in that two-hour window, when we lost my son, not one time that I look at the fact that I got three kids, Shane. Yeah, and you know what? I got two out of three right now. 66% are pretty good odds. I'm still winning by those numbers. Not one time that I say, let's ignore the fact that Evan is not here, and let's go to Dairy Queen and go get some ice cream right now, just because we'll see if he ever makes it back. Not one time that I act like him being lost was irrelevant. Eventually, it got to the place when my daughter said, can we do this? I said, no one's doing anything until we find your brother. He may not matter to you, but he matters to me, and so we're going to look for him until he shows up again. And we went on an all manhunt going through the city of Fitchburg until we found out. Don't you? I want you to know that that is the heart of your heavenly father that right now he's walking around saying, I need my people. The Holy Spirit is moving on your life to pray and to intercede for your sisters and your uncles and your aunties and your grandmother and your uncles, whether they're in church, outside of church. He's saying, if they are not connected to me, the job's not done. Because when it all gets settled and it's all said and done, we take nothing to heaven but people. You're not taking a U-Haul with you. Your storage is not going with you. It doesn't matter how many sneakers you got, Emmy. Somebody else will be wearing them when you die. Uh-huh. Settle that right now, young people, old people who still got all these addictions. Nothing goes with you except people. Naked I came into the world, Job said, and naked I shall return. So God is in love with people, and he's using people to reach people. I posted something last night before I went to bed. All I kept thinking about, I shared this with, I think it was Paul. I'm convinced that when it comes to humanity, life is all about love. Everything else is what we get lost into trying to figure out what that is. We were designed to be recipients of love, and we were designed to give it. And oftentimes we get lost in all of these false attempts to find it. But in reality, it's about us. And isn't it interesting that God is love? So if life is all about finding love and being loved, maybe it starts with the one who is love. Goodness gracious. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. I'm feeling a little better than I did this morning, okay? Okay, good. You see how when you start sharing what's on your heart, people can support you better? So let's just help out some of these people who don't say anything and you think we can read your mind. We don't know what's going on unless you say something. You sitting there looking funky and everybody else doesn't know what's going on. They're like, yo, just stay away from mom. She's not talking. We think she's cooking on the inside. <laughs> Ticking time bomb. Sometimes you got to sit these rascals down and just say, I ain't doing too well today. I'm going to need you. To, I'm going to solicit some prayers for my five-year-olds. Will you pray with me? Uh-huh. Goodness gracious, that was good right there. If you came for that little piece right there, you came for a good word right there. I got to start opening my mouth. And do it in a healthy way. Don't take it out on other people who ain't got nothing to do with it. <laughs> and if you do repent and say sorry, I'm sorry. You wasn't your dad. That was for your dad. That wasn't for you. <laughs> First Corinthians chapter 3. Let me give you one more verse. <laughs> 
First Corinthians uh, chapter 3, the name of the message today is, Can God Use Your Words to Share His Word? First Corinthians 3, verse uh, 1, to, well, let me just give you what I have here. Uh, starting from verse 1, I'm going to jump around. Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly. He's talking to Christians, and he's drawing a divide between mature believers and immature believers. Because how many people know you can have both? Uh, be, just live long enough. You can have both. Just because you have an immature one doesn't mean they lost their salvation because they're still tripping. Yeah. You got to say that to some of these people who think that, that Christianity is performance-based. If it was performance-based, we're all going to hell. Right. The person who performed for us is Jesus. That's why it's a free gift by faith, and I receive it because of his grace. And let me get out of that. Now, don't hear something I didn't say. I'm not justifying you doing wrongdoing. You got to say that because sometimes in the brokenness of the way you think, is Pastor Emmy justifying saying, no, that's your broken brain? Yes. I ain't say nothing like that. But the problem is we have a hard time receiving love, and we always think we got to perform for it. And just because your mom made you perform for love doesn't mean that God does. Because God knows how to love you even when people don't, and God knows how to be faithful even when you're faithless. God is consistent with giving love even when people are inconsistent. And you got to say that, and you got to draw a line between the two. So if we live right, it enhances the quality of my life. But if I don't live right, it doesn't stop God from loving me. Because when I'm not living right, I'm probably feeling fearful and insecure, and I'm going to need to know that someone's love is consistent when I'm inconsistent. So if anything, knowing that God loves me no matter what is empowering to pull me out of the hole that I'm down in. Yeah. That's another good point. If you came today, you came for that one, too. That was a good one, too. Let me, let me finish the text. I just got to read. Just shut up, M. Verse 2. He says, I gave you milk, not solid food. For you were not yet ready for it. Indeed, you're still not ready. He says, some people are eating on the level that they're at. Let me move on. Verse 3, you are still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere people, humans? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another says, I'm following Apollos, are you not being human beings? That's a message. Because... Because we follow Jesus, not fan clubs. Jesus is your Lord and Savior. You might appreciate certain vessels that he used, but please don't get it twisted and start deifying people. Um, go look up the word. Verse 5. What then, after all, is Apollos? And what is Paul? The only servants through whom you came to believe. As the Lord has assigned to each his task. This, this is my point. I said all that to get to this verse. I planted the seed. Apollos, somebody else, they watered it. But God has been making it grow. Some of you, your job is to plant the seed. Some of you might even water the same seed that you're planted. But ultimately, real growth and pushing people growing in the kingdom comes from God. One man plants. Another man waters. But God gives increase. One man plants, another man waters that which was planted, but ultimately God makes it grow. Stop trying to force growth, control freak. God makes it grow. When you start playing God, <laughs> I'm feeling better. <laughs> One man planted another water, but God is making it grow. So neither, verse 7, so neither the one who plants or the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes the thing grow. Our job is to keep, we're farmers, and God is using you to plant seeds. Stop being twisted because you didn't get the response from the person that you wanted the response from. The reality is if you planted a seed from the word of God, that word cannot return to God empty. It cannot return to God void. Even a farmer understands when they plant seed, they're not going to get a harvest overnight. But they understand they will get a harvest over time. So they keep planting seeds and trusting that if, God, you're going to use me to water it, I'll be honored. But if you're going to use someone else to water it, do your thing, Lord, because ultimately the growth of that seed in that person comes from God. Yes. Yes. Let me say something else. Can, <laughs> can I say it the way I want to say it? Because we got a little codependent flow in Christianity, and some of you want to force a disciple. 
I, I hear this term because, you know, I've been rocking in church for a minute. We got to make disciples. Well, you're not going to headlock them in your basement and make a creation called the Christian. We need their participation. So you are not going to stress me out as the pastor because I know I'd be chefing and cooking some good food. But I can't make you eat. How many people had a baby sitting in a high chair? You start feeding them. Oh, they're going to eat until they hit that lid. And when they hit that lid, that baby can't talk. That baby don't got teeth. But that baby going to tell you I'm done eating. And they're going to spit it right back out. And you'll be like, ooh, I'm done. You can't force feed anything else. Uh huh. And when it comes to people, understand that same concept. Stop force feeding people who don't want to eat what you're serving. Stop casting your pearls before swine. Stop. Sometimes when you are forcing your way, it's only because you're uncomfortable with the response and it's a sign of control from you, not them. Because if I plant a seed, I got to trust that the power of that seed is going to do something because that's God's seed, not my seed. And when God plants seed, how many people know that God's about to have a baby, Mary? God's going to have a baby. I don't care if you ain't never copulated before. Fancy word. Uh, go look it up yourself. But Mary may have never engaged in the activity, but she got knocked up because God's seed is more potent than a man's seed. So when you are sowing God's seed into the hearts of people, something is going to happen even if you don't see anything happening. I hit you with the prince, the artist, formerly known as prince. The one, verse 8, the one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and they will each be rewarded according to their own labor. For we are God's co-workers. We are God. I didn't write verse 9. We are God's Co-workers. We are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field. God's, God says, I'm in business with you. I'm in partnership with you. You are working with me. Will you open up your mouth and plant a seed? Invite somebody to come. Invite somebody to church if you can't do it. If you can do it, then lead them to the Lord. Sh share what I've done in your life. Oh, let's say something about that really quick. Just because your life doesn't look as exciting as someone else's life, it still matters. And please stop defining excitement by trauma. Hold on, hold on. We got to say this because somebody came to me and they said, Emmy, well, my life doesn't necessarily, it's not like your life. And I said, hold on. You're giving me the impression that you think my life is worth telling. Do you know how much trauma I had to go through to get to a place that you call excitement? It's exciting because you ain't go through it. But when you being molested and abused and beat up, hold on a second, homeboy. I know it looks like a movie, but there's nothing exciting when you're on that side of it. The reality is we still have to share the story no matter what your story looks like. I told them, this is what I told them. Your story has to matter because I'm raising my kids to be like you. So how can your story be irrelevant when I'm trying to raise my son to look like you as a believer? You were raised in a Christian home. You don't think I want my children to be raised in some form of safety? Yeah. Of course, if that's the outcome, young people, listen to me. Yeah. Stop thinking, well, you ain't been through anything. That is the goal. Yeah. What are we talking about? You want to be a crackhead like your uncle? Yeah. People are crazy. <laughs> Sometimes we don't think about what we... Oh. I got four points for you. Let me see if I can get this out of the way. <laughs> can God use your words to share his word? Because yeah. you are a co-worker in the kingdom of God. Yeah. He's not doing this independently of you. He's doing it with you. You are in covenant with him. Yeah. Covenant. Yeah. God told Abraham, should I prevent or not tell Abraham what I'm about to do? That's what he said to Abraham. Well, that's what he said <laughs> to himself that about to tell Abraham before he judged Sodom and Gomorrah. Y'all, let me go talk to Abraham, my covenant man, and put him on to what I'm about to do because I'm going to need his help. Yeah, okay. Four points for you. Um, I'm going to give you the four right now. Number one is aware. Number two is prayer. Number three is care. And number four is share. Number one is aware. Number two is prayer. So these four points have a lot to do with us sharing our faith. So number one is aware. You could put up that point. 
Number one is aware. These four points has a lot to do with sharing our faith. On, let me see what I have here real quick. I have this, well, I sent this to somebody. I don't even know why they printed out so many copies. Because at first I was going to print this out and give it to you. You can feel free to scan that, dig, that QR code, and then that scale is going to pop up for you. So I have some that are here because they printed them out, and we were initially here. Because there's no need for me to keep them. There's only three of them there. So, and they laminated them, and I'm like, dude, we got to print out like 600 of these. No, let's not do that. <laughs> we're going to force people to go digital. <laughs> so scan that. That's going to come up. This scale came from a guy who wrote a book called... Um, what was the name of the book? The name of the book was called What's Wrong with the Harvest? And it had a lot to do with evangelism. It had a lot to do with reaching people. It, and it created a scale. This guy named James, Dr. James uh, Engel, created this scale. And on this scale, this scale has now been modified. They got permission from Dr. James. And they made some certain universities and Christian places made some alterations to it to enhance um, the whole process. And if you notice on the left side, it says at that stage when you're down on that level, it says you're possibly a cynic. Then you move up to being a skeptic. Then somebody is probably just a spectator at that point. They watch and they, this might be some interest. Like, talk to me. And then it moves up on the left side of the screen to being a seeker. And then at some point after seeking, you make a decision at that place that says trust in Christ. You're at that, that, that flat line, if you will, where that bubble is in the middle of your, of your level. And then you eventually make a decision for Christ. You become a believer. And just because you're a believer in Christ doesn't necessarily mean you have been discipled or you're being discipled. So there's other steps to begin to grow. And so you see that. So you can feel free to scan that and to mark that down. Um, but let me mention this. Be aware that everyone you meet is somewhere on the scale. Someone. Well, I'm an atheist. I ain't nowhere on the scale. <laughs> Brother, you on there. <laughs> you on there. You're somewhere at the bottom, but you on there. And so it's our way to kind of evaluate where people may fall so we can encourage them in the journey. Now, remember, oh, I get, I'm about to say something. I'm going to get ahead of myself. So really quick, let me just run down this really quick. I have a, neg a negative six number that's on the screen, and it says resistant. And so resistant might be, let's say this is the bottom of it. I'm convinced that if you're resistant to the gospel in general, let me help you out. I don't go back and forth and fight with people. Okay. But it doesn't also intimidate me because you riled up about God that I stopped talking. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, I'm going to plant a seed. So if you're resistant, what I've learned in my experience, guys, is that oftentimes your antithetical anti-theist people are typically traumatized. They're hurt. They're dealing with something that has injured the heart. It has. So I don't even bring up Bible with the atheist. For the most part, tell me about your upbringing. <laughs> talk to me about your fam. Just want to talk about that because I, I guarantee you to some degree you were raised around some religious nut who saved. They're probably going to heaven, but the way they represented the gospel was so heavy on you as a child that you grew up waiting to use your voice so that you can curse every Christian out to say, I'll never get involved in this ever again in my life. Shame off any parent. Sometimes we don't draw a line of distinction between religion and relationship. And let me just give you a little line. When you don't have grace for human error and you are really hard on the human heart, you're probably raising people to hate the Bible, hate God, and to hate Jesus. When Jesus is like, bro, I ain't got nothing to do with that. I wish I can get involved in that, but that's the best representative you're going to get right now until I send somebody else in your life. But at this point, we need to work on the heart. So anyways, you see this. You get negative five receptive. They're starting to seek at number four, negative, considering, and this is the same aspect. The goal is to get them to a place where they can potentially be ready to get exposed to the gospel and then begin a new life in Christ. I do want to mention number one, the plus one here. After somebody gets saved, I think it is important for people to recognize that being a part of a local assembly is important. You got to say this because sometimes when you get around people, people are those things, <laughs> those things, humans are those things that you, you feel like you can't live without them, but, but you need them. I, if I get too close, someone gets hurt. But if I don't get close at all, I'm complaining they ain't got no friends. I've been doing this long enough. Let's just look at everybody. I've been doing this long enough to just know. 
if you stay in isolation too long, you're going to hear the whispers from heaven saying it is not good for this man or one man to be alone. Uh huh. You need community. And, and mind you, remember, God said that to Adam and all God all Adam had was God. But when you get hurt by people, you'll say things like, I don't need church. I don't need people. And God said to Adam, all you have is me. But the way that your body has been hardwired by me insinuates you're going to need some people around you. And how many people know that when you're going through a tough time, although you've got God, you're going to need some flesh and blood to give a high five to and get a hug from and maybe a kiss on the cheek and have to hear somebody else's voice to the people who are clapping who could be real with life on this side of the audience because them jokers apparently never been hurt. Okay, so evangelism is helping people discover how God is ready uh, as, as already at work in people's lives. So go back and look at that scale, and then you can gauge it. Number two. Number two is, is about prayer. Prayer. Prayer, prayer, prayer. Who would you like to see come to know Jesus? How many believers we got in this building? Jesus is your Lord and Savior. Okay. So how many people would you like to see to come to know Jesus? Are you believing God for anyone to be saved? I, I, are you believing God? Some, you'd be surprised how many people have never heard the term before. Uh, this is not accidental. You have the right to release your faith on behalf of someone who's unbelieving to believe that they will get revelation on who Jesus is so that they can make a decision like you made a decision. Believe me, when you give your life to Christ, I guarantee you somebody was praying for you. No, no, no. This is not just about persuasion. It's about prayer and persuasion. Uh huh. Lord, I'm about to present the gospel and the apostle Paul would write oftentimes in the epistles, pray for me that when I preach that the word of God may go forth boldly, may go forward with clarity so that people can receive the gospel. So it's not just about we need somebody persuasive. That might be part of the equation, but it's also prayer. Uh, somebody say pray. pray. So number two is we want to commit to that person for prayer. So here's a few points under the subtitle of prayer. Commit to, uh, to prayer for that person. Whoever the person is, uh, pray that the Father would draw them closer to Jesus. In John chapter 6, verse 44, here's a few verses for you. Jesus said, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them, and I will raise them up on the last day. So you want to commit that. Listen, we want the Father. When we lift up the name of Jesus, that's all some of the work the Holy Spirit needs. But, but you need to be praying for that person that you want them to see who Jesus is. No, another sub point under this point of prayer is I want you to pray against the spirit that blinds that person's mind. OK, now, if you've been rocking with the Lord for a while and you have some form of biblical literacy, you understand what I'm talking about. For those of you who are newer, 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 you're like, yo, what are you talking about? Let me give you a verse for that. Second Corinthians chapter four, verse four. The God of this age that's called Satan has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Listen to me. We are living in a time period right now where there are a lot of influential factors that are, that are interfering with the way people think about God and think about the gospel. So not only is the heart being hurt by sin and trauma and fear in people, but then the mind is being polluted with all kinds of things online and the web and oversaturation with negative information constantly. And so the Bible says specifically that we have the God of this world trying to blind the minds of unbelievers. So, so if the scriptures are right, some of the weapons that we have as believers are to bind uh, the enemy. So I would pray for someone, and let's say Johnny. No offense to anybody named Johnny. I used the name twice, but it's just my random go-to. Uh, uh, so if I'm praying for Johnny, I'm praying that if I know his mind is, is bound up and he cannot see the gospel and I want him to be saved, one of my prayers in my prayer for Johnny, Father, I come against any spirit. I bind any spirit that is blinding his mind and stopping him from seeing the gospel. I don't have that power, Lord. You have that power. But I come against all those forces that are preventing him from seeing. Not the eyes of his um, head, the eyes that are in his heart. We need him to see that. Another point to consider is pray that that person may come to know God relationally. If you've been coming to this church for some time, I talk a lot about relationships not religion. It's a pet peeve. I'm human. But I will absolutely spaz on religion. Drives me crazy. 
There's been plenty of times. I get a guy who came out of jail, 30, did 35 years. Homeboy, sit right next to me. Just sit next to me. I don't care. I don't care what they say. You need the gospel. And you got all these fears and all these issues that are preventing. Believe me, the woman who got caught in the act of adultery, just remove her out the Bible and re replace her with many other faces that you see in this day and age. Well, I don't know if I can go to that church because your auntie is talking about him and he's a registered sex offender. And I don't know. Yo, my man, you're going to sit right next to me. Don't get it twisted. I can fight. Just sit right there. Let's get into the gospel. And the God, the God. Yeah, I'm saying there's been people who will say things to me, send me emails. Keep them. Thank you for the warning and all that. But the gospel is what changes the human heart, not your fearful approach that says you have to eliminate them in order for me to feel better about coming to your church. Better by ya, you better off leaving and going to another church. I'm a very risky kind of person. Hear me out. And don't clap about that and then go against everything that I'm saying. Uh-huh. That's why you like me, because I be telling you the truth. Romans chapter 8, verse 15, back to the point on relationship, not religion. Romans 8, 15, the spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. Yeah. So, Lord, I, I want, going back to Johnny again, <laughs> whoever Johnny is in the building, boy, that brother's going to get saved after today. But, Father, I pray, Lord, that he sees a relational approach, that you pierce his heart in a way where he can cry out, Abba, which is a Greek terminology, closest word to daddy. It's not even father. It's like, Dad, I need you. Um, and so you want to add that to your prayer. Here's another point on the prayer. Pray that believers will cross that person's path and enter into a positive relationship with that individual. Matthew chapter 9, verse 38 says it this way. Then he, Jesus, said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. He says, I don't have a lot of workers. There's a mad people out there that need the gospel. I don't have enough people talking about me. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. So sometimes when you're praying for your kids and you feel like you're losing them a little bit to culture, you're losing them a little bit to the world, I'll pray. I, I, okay, I could say this. Um, I, I'll pray this way for my own kids in general. Um, I, sometimes I try to be cautious about because, you know, they're my kids. And I, so, but I, I'll pray this way about my kids and I'll just say, Lord, I don't know what it is right now. Do they need somebody of influence? Because how many parents know that although my voice can be impactful in your life, your voice can be so common to them that they overlook what other people listen to? I tell my kids all the time, Jen, I'm just like, how come thousands of people will listen to me, but you won't? So don't get it, don't be all twisted and acting like what's going on. I think it's a normal process. Familiarity settles in. And sometimes God has to say the same thing through a different face. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you want to pray, Lord, I want somebody with swag that represents the kingdom. I want them to like who they hear it from, Lord, so surround them with the right people so that they like the vessel and hear your word. And ultimately, their hearts get transformed. To me, honestly, I'll be honest with you, and I've had other pastors and people, I had a pastor approach me, he was like, my daughter comes to your church, and she don't come to my church. I said, but we do this together as a family, because if my kids ever start, I, w I don't care where they go as long as they're connected to God and connected to the body in some aspect. This is not about territorialism or anything like that. Wherever they can hear the gospel, let them be hearers and receivers of it. And then here's my last one for you under the sub point of prayer. Pray that they get revelation of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done for them. Mm -hmm. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 17. This is a very good verse when you're praying and you can insert that person's name in there. Ephesians 1 17 and 18. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he's praying right now. This is a good prayer. The glorious father that he may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. He says, I want you to pray. So let's go back to Johnny again. Uh, Lord, I pray that you give Johnny the spirit of wisdom and revelation in order that he may know you better. And then he goes on to the next verse. I, I pray that the eyes of his heart, not his head, the eyes of his heart may be enlightened in order that he may know the hope to which you, uh, uh, to, that he may know the hope to which you, you have called him. And you want to add his name in there and be praying over him with these verses because we're taking God's seed and presenting it back to God again. 
So we bring people into the kingdom by prayer and persuasion, not just persuasion. We have to remember that. Number three, number three, the first one is uh, be aware. Everyone falls on the scale somewhere. Despite whether you can figure out where they are, it's immaterial. We just know that they're on a journey, whether they realize it or not. Number two, prayer is important. So we're praying for people to come into the kingdom. What's the name of the message? Can God use your words to share his word? Number three is care. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. John Maxwell said that. I want to say it again and give him credit for it. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. So hear me out. Don't become a Christian and lose your care. Okay. Let me me say this really quick. Sometimes it's hard to teach this point because some people think that you only care when you worry like they worry. If I'm not as fearful as you are about the scenario, then you're, you're implying I don't care about it like you do. Not true. Not true. I can still carry care for you and not have to be worried like you. Yeah. Uh-huh. So we are the ones that are planting seeds. We are the ones that are water, uh, watering those seeds. But remember, we are not responsible for the growth that's between the person and God. I am not a detective. I'm not going to be chasing them around, taking pictures, wondering if they living out everything that I'm saying to you. That is, you crazy. You would stress me out if that was the responsibilities of a pastor. No, I I got a bunch of sheep, and I'm going to provide a great patch of green grass. And if the sheep don't sheep it, it ain't going to get ate. Bad English, good preaching. You understand my point. You cannot want change for someone else that doesn't want it. But that doesn't mean that we are robbed of responsibilities of still sharing and planting seed in their lives. Uh huh. Stop becoming so overwhelmed because uh, you're in a season with God that not, but nobody's responding to you. Get used to it. But it doesn't stop us from talking. We're going to keep planting seed. Don't confuse care with codependence. You just have to say that. Don't, don't confuse. I can still care for you and not be responsible for you. That, uh huh. Uh-huh, I don't know what's going on in her life, but that's a fact. <laughs> that's my girl. <laughs> <What are you> playing? <laughs> I lost my train of thought. Uh, let me move on to the next one. Uh, don't confuse care with cognition. And this is what I mean about this being deep. Yeah. Sometimes in an attempt to be deep and give people the Greek words and the Hebrew words, we lose our care because we think they want theology and they don't want theology. They just want a touch from God. And so sometimes that can, in other words, if someone is drowning, whatever in, in an addiction, in a habit, in a sin, if they are drowning, how many people know that they need a life raft? Okay, they don't need the Greek and Hebrew word for life raft. (laughs) And some of you want to be so deep, but your depth theologically is not helping the person who's drowning. And so don't confuse care with cognition. I don't need your Greek. I just needed a sandwich. How many people know what I'm talking about? We got to translate this the right way because sometimes we're giving people things that they don't need. And we think that they need it because it's important to us, but it may not be important to where they are. First Corinthians chapter eight, as as I prepare to land, now I will write about first Corinthians chapter eight, verses one to three. Now I will write about the meat that is sacrificed to idols. It is certainly true that we all have knowledge as you say, but this knowledge only fills people with pride. It is love that helps the church grow stronger. Sometimes we think if we get more information, it just helps the heart. No, it helps your head. If you don't love at the same level that you're eating intellectually, your brain will get bigger than your heart. You will have a big head, but a small heart. That's what creates religion at times in churches because you know a lot, you impress the people a lot, but you step over the people you are trying to impress. Yeah. Let me stretch this. I want my heart to grow as big as my head. As a matter of fact, I need my heart to grow bigger than my head. Uh, I I want to care about it more than I think about it. Uh huh. Because God is going to move through my heart, not necessarily always through my head, because my mind needs to be renewed and it's not always renewed. So I need the love of God to come through me when my mind is acting up. 
Last one, number four is share. Are you getting anything out of this? I gotta land this plane, Jen, I'm coming for you. Uh, 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 number four is share. Be prepared to share. You're always gonna have an opportunity. Did we give our invitation cards today? On the way in, did you get it? If you didn't get any of the invitation cards, I don't know how many we got. Like, hypothetically, let's just say we have a 1,000. I don't need a 1,000 cards when the day's over with. That need to go in your hand, and whether you throw them away or you give them to somebody, they need to get out this building. So invite people to one of these three services coming up. Matter of fact, four. We got one on Friday, and we got three on Sunday. If you're a regular attender or you worship, like you're, you are part of our team already, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask that, that you uh, don't worship in that second one. Let's leave some margin in that one for all your first-time visitors, for your new families. I know that that second one, I already know. I've been doing this long enough that half you joke is going to be standing anyways. So let's just make margin. I'm going to go to the first or I'm going to go to the third, whatever the case is, and I'm not sure what you got to do. I don't know if it's going to be snowing next week. I don't know. Massachusetts is funny like that. But my point is let's make preparation for that. The invitation cards, you can grab them on the way out and start inviting people to church. Let me give you one verse as we prepare to close. Romans chapter 10. This is a chapter where the apostle Paul is discouraged because his own people don't see Jesus as Lord, and he wants them to be saved. Okay, Christian terminology, that means that they're going to be saved, redeemed, come into relationship with God. Go back and read the entire chapter in its entirety. I'm going to start from verse 8. But what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the message concerning faith that we proclaim. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As scripture says, this is one of my mantra verses, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. God is not rejecting you like your great grandmother was. Uh huh. I don't care how angry your uncle was, he's not rejecting you. Anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame, for there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all those who call on him. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Verse 14. But how can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they haven't even heard? And how can they hear unless somebody is preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless you joke as a sent? This whole process doesn't work if we don't get involved with God. The name of the message, can God use your words to share his word? And yes, Isaiah chapter whatever, nine, whatever, six. Here I am. Lord, send me. God wants to use you. Don't stress yourself out. You're not God. Don't stress yourself out. You're not responsible for growth. You're just responsible to plant a seed. You know that most Christians will go their entire Christianity and won't even try to lead one person or share their faith to one person? Yo, with this digital age and this relational age, we, we can plant some seed. I officially knight you as farmers everywhere you go <laughs> and hear me out my mind is running because I really want to challenge all kinds of people we're going to plant the right seed yeah. Jesus name and plant God's word everywhere we go because it can't return to him void let's pray right now I pray you got something out of today's message father in Jesus name we're on assignment Lord, if you don't come back between now on this Palm Sunday leading up to what we would call Easter or Resurrection Sunday, Lord, we still know that it's not your will that any should perish, but that everyone comes to repentance. Father, we hit reset in our hearts and we get on assignment. We look for opportunities to give out invitation cards. We leverage our social media platforms and we invite people to church. We thank you, Lord, because we're going to do our best to put people in a position to hear your word. This is a group effort, Lord. We do this together. Your word declares that we are co-workers with you. Some people might be led to the Lord by someone in this room because they know what to do. And some people in this room just have enough in them to get them to church and then I'll lead them to the Lord. And together we played a role and populated heaven 
and snatching them from the clutches of hell. Father, we give you praise because in your heart, I know you see the world being saved, at least by faith. I know Jesus said broad and wide is the road that leads to destruction and very few find it, but I'm not going to be a cynic or negative and just believe that that's the, I'm going to go and try my best to plant as much seed as possible, believing that your word has enough power to snatch everyone we plant seed into to see them changed. Your word is powerful. It's going to work wonders and we'll do it this today and moving forward this week. Now, if you're here right now and you came today, the Bible says today is the day of salvation. So today's your day. Yeah. I just read to you Romans chapter 10. You believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. It's, we call it the kerygma. It's found in 1 Corinthians 15. And according to the scriptures, Jesus Christ was born of a woman, born by a virgin. He died for sin. He resurrected on the third day, defied death to prove that he was Lord over death, told you about it before he actually did it so that you could be confused by it and question whether or not he was God. Showed himself to 500 people like a commercial before he left and then left. And we've been talking about this guy for thousands of years. People argue about him, but he's risen. We debate about him, but he's risen. And there's a bunch of living testimonies in here saying that he delivered me from this. He redeemed me from this. He set me free from this. I used to be like this. And I'm giving credit to Jesus. If you don't know the Lord as your personal Lord and Savior, today is your day. I would advise that you don't walk out of this building without making Jesus the Lord of your life. I don't care if you're here sitting down, if you're standing up. This message was for you. So if you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life and today you're going to hit reset in this area and you want me to pray for you, just let me know who you are. Ready? On the count of three. One, two, three. Let me pray for me. I'm giving my life to the Lord and I'm starting over. This service was for you, young lady. My man, God bless you. Thank you for coming. Thank you. God bless you too. And I see that hand. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you for the confidence. It takes a lot. It takes a lot. I see all those hands. Can everyone pray this with me with confidence? I can help you with the words, but I can't say it with genuineness in, my, in your heart. You can only do this. And with everyone else who's already a believer, can you join us with confidence? It doesn't hurt you at all. It just encourages them. Say this with confidence. Everyone say, Heavenly Father, I thank you for Jesus and his sacrifice for me. I repent of my sin. I make Jesus my Lord. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. My life belongs to you. I will grow and I will tell others about what you've done in my life. You can have it all. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, can we put